for logging and calling in today to hear our webinar on using IRAs uh, to invest in real estate. But with a little twist today, we'll talk about how people use LLCs and trusts to act with along with their IRA to actually buy real estate and go over kind of some of the unique rules and go through some of the case studies to show exactly how people structure that investment, uh, just give you a lot of things hopefully to think about uh, as you watch the webinar today. Uh, for anyone who's listening live, as you have questions during the webinar, uh, please don't hesitate to ha type them into the chat box on, their, on your screen. I'll make sure I get to those questions during the webinar today. Uh, if you are watching a recording of this webinar, uh, you can jot down your questions as you watch the webinar. My phone number and email address will appear at the end of the webinar that you can certainly contact me afterwards uh, to get any questions answered uh, that we don't really address within the webinar. My name is Scott Maurer. I'm the Director of Business Development for Advanta IRA. I'm also a licensed attorney. Uh, I don't do any legal work for Advanta, though, but I think some of what we'll talk about today, my legal background gives me maybe a little bit better understanding uh, of what it is that we will talk about. And I've been with the company now for several years. Um, I spent the last uh, few years doing much more of the education, uh, networking, and marketing for the company, uh, both in our Tampa office and also in our Atlanta office as well. Now, just a quick disclaimer on what we do and don't do at Advanta IRA. Um, we talk today, especially we're talking about LLCs and trusts, uh, a lot of times individuals do utilize an attorney, or they might utilize a CPA to help get those entities structured or also maybe have questions about how they are taxed uh, and how that works with the IRA account. At Advanta IRA, we cannot give you legal tax, uh, legal or tax advice when it comes to your IRA. Now, we are going to talk about some potential legal issues today. We can certainly outline those and make you aware if there's an issue present or possibly present for what you're looking at doing, uh, but you would need to consult with an attorney or maybe a CPA to get a final determination uh, when making an investment. We simply act as a record keeper uh, for the account. Additionally, we don't do any due diligence on investments. So if you're looking to use your IRA to buy uh, into a private LLC or maybe to buy a piece of real estate uh, with your IRA funds, we are not going to evaluate that investment for you. That is up to you to decide if that investment makes sense uh, for you and what it is that you're looking to do with your retirement account. Now before we jump into that aspect and going into more of the meat of the presentation, just for those on the call uh, or those who are listening to the recording, why haven't you heard of self-directed IRAs before? Or maybe uh, since you're on the call listening to the webinar, you've heard about it. Why haven't most people heard of self-directed IRAs? Or maybe why did you just recently find out about uh, this type of investing strategy? I think the biggest reason why most people have not heard of self-direction is simply that most IRAs, most people have a 401k possibly through an employer, those accounts are held with banks and brokerage firms, uh, institutions who offer you limited investment products. You can buy their mutual funds, you can buy their stocks, uh, other types of publicly traded securities, but they within their IRAs and within their plans do not allow for an individual to take that money and buy a piece of rental property or to invest in a private LLC that we'll talk about today. IRS regulations do allow for a much broader range of investments uh, than what those brokerage firms or banks offer to their clients but the rules do not require each custodian of an IRA to hold all of the permissible investments. That's why you would see individuals setting up an account with us to buy real estate, to buy private placements and private LLCs, and individuals using an IRA fund to invest with a Schwab or a Fidelity to invest in more kind of conventional type assets because each custodian decides what they're willing to hold. We are not a broker dealer, so we do not deal with uh, publicly traded assets, and since that publicly traded assets are their business, brokerage firms typically don't deal with real estate and other types of private investments. As far as the possible IRA investments, um, really any type of real estate, uh, anything that comes with a deed is something you could own within an IRA account, whether it's raw land, whether it's rental, uh, either short-term or long-term rentals, uh, people doing rehabs, you know, buying and flipping houses uh, is permissible within an IRA. Uh, even some people investing in commercial property uh, is allowable as well. Um, we also see a number of paper assets where people are investing into mortgage loans or unsecured notes where their IRA is a lender. Um, you have a third party acting as a borrower on that transaction. And then kind of another catch-all category where we do see a number of private LLCs, private partnerships. Um, those are 
usually take a couple of different forms because LLCs and partnerships are so um, uh, versatile in what you want to use them for. We've seen people investing in an LLC that maybe is uh, just for their own IRA account and they get what's called checkbook control uh, over their account. We will talk about that later on in the presentation today. But also individuals who are doing uh, maybe starting up a new company. Um, they are looking to raise capital and they may issue stock in their new company in the form of an LLC. We've certainly seen people uh, investing in those as well. Now the types of accounts that can be self-directed, um, any type of IRA, whether it's a traditional or Roth, which are the individual retirement accounts, or a SEP or simple IRA. And a SEP or simple are usually tied uh, to maybe a small business owner, someone who uh, owns their own business, maybe has a few employees or maybe no employees at all, they can establish a SEP or simple IRA that allows them to contribute more money in a given year to those types of accounts. We also offer an individual 401k plan and also education and health savings accounts as well. Those are obviously not retirement accounts, but they'll follow the same set of rules we're going to talk about here in just a moment. Now, the other accounts that are, could be self-directed would be any former employer's plan. If you have uh, worked for a company or worked for um, possibly the government in some capacity, and you've had a 401k, you've had a 403b or a thrift savings plan, it's one of those uh, employer-type plans. You can, once you leave employment, roll those monies into a traditional self-directed IRA. So again, not included on maybe on this slide per se, but you can invest as well with old employer plans. If it's a current 401k uh, through your current employer, a lot of times they do restrict your ability uh, to move that money. But any former employer's plan uh, is accessible to be self-directed. Now people self-direct for a couple of different reasons, uh, sometimes uh, multiple reasons. But a lot of it, we've been talking to clients it's people wanting to get more diversity within their retirement accounts. So they're using their IRA in different ways. Instead of buying just different types of mutual funds, you know, growth funds, aggressive funds, et cetera, they actually are looking to get diversity really outside of publicly traded assets altogether, really getting maybe true diversity as opposed to what a broker uh, would discuss as diversity within a, within a brokerage account. And for a lot of our clients, it's choosing an investment that they understand. Um, Investing in real estate might make more sense to an individual than does investing in the stock market, and vice versa, obviously, for, for others as well. So for some individuals, it's choosing an investment um, where they understand the pros and cons and maybe the ups and downs, and also maybe even understand how you get returns on those investments, whereby you, know, you rent, rent a piece of real estate, for example, or if you do a private mortgage, you know that that note mortgage or that piece of real estate is going to return you know, probably between 10 and 12% a year, as long as everything, you know, the tenants are paying or, or the borrower is paying on that loan. That might make more sense to an individual, again, than investing in the stock market. And tied along with that is the ability for an individual to invest in tangible assets. But people feel more comfortable at times if they know that their IRA is tied up or has purchased an investment that is an actual piece of real estate, something they can look at something they can see, or if they've lent money, they know who that person is on the other side who's going to be paying them back, makes them feel more secure rather than having their money tied to a stock market where the ups and the downs seem to make no sense to them, uh, at least as far as making different types of investments. So these are just some of the reasons we see people self-direct. Sometimes it is for a tax reason uh, and that the investments you make within an IRA account are non-taxable. So if you were investing in a piece of real estate, and you have rental property and rental income coming back in, you don't pay tax on that. If you're invested into a private partnership, uh, and that private partnership turns back a dividend each month, you don't pay taxes there either. So sometimes uh, there is a tax component as well uh, to making that investment. Now what we're going to talk about more to in depth today is really the types of private placements and how people structure these uh, different investments um, and going over maybe what, what types they are. There's a couple different ways people have used these LLCs, trusts, and partnerships to actually buy real estate. And again, we're kind of focused a little bit more on real estate today, but this will extend a little bit more as well into just general private placement, hedge funds, et cetera, that people look to invest in. We'll talk a little bit about disqualified persons because it's, it's important to understand there who's disqualified, uh, what the rules are when you're making investments within your IRA, and especially if you're looking at doing a checkbook control, um, how that works and what the rules are with that type of structure. We'll go over to some things to avoid 
uh, when you're making a private placement investment uh, using an LLC or trust, and also go over a number of case studies that really show you a couple of things. One, flushing out more of the rules that we talked about, and also just to show you what the process is. If you have an IRA or you're looking to invest an IRA in this fashion, what is the process? How does it work? And what kind of paperwork and documentation do we require uh, at Advanto? Now, first off, what is a private placement? Uh, very simply, it's an asset uh, that generally it's not publicly traded. It's not something you can buy on the, on the stock exchange, but it looks a lot like the types of assets you can buy possibly in those uh, arenas. For instance, buying private stock, buying into a private LLC or private partnership looks a lot like buying a stock on the you know, New York Stock Exchange, but the fact it's, public, it's, it's pu not publicly traded, it's a private investment, um, just makes it a little bit different process, and again, needing to utilize a self-directed IRA in order to make that investment. Now again, private stock, this is probably the most, uh, the simplest kind of investment to understand when we talk about private placements. And they're very simply, a private stock is just like a stock of a regular company, it's just, it's not publicly traded. So again, it's not available out there for the general purchase. Uh, the shares might not be as liquid, might not be as easy to sell those shares uh, if need be. Um, but a lot of times these stock that we've seen uh, at Advanta with our clients could be in a startup company uh, or also local community banks. So again, they're private banks and they're looking to raise capital to put out there in loans, might be utilizing self-directed IRAs or have clients utilizing self-directed IRAs to actually invest uh, in that private stock. And again, just simply because it's not publicly traded, most brokerage firms and banks don't want to hold that type of asset. The other type of private place that we see, uh, LLCs and LPs, basically limited liability companies and limited partnerships. And these are statutorily created entities um, that allow for a lot of different activity uh, within the particular LLC or particular partnership. Now, if you have a self-directed IRA, your IRA could invest and become a partner, could become a member uh, in one of those types of entities and have then the benefits, the, the profits basically from those investments flowing ultimately back into your IRA. Now, I mentioned that we've seen with the, as far as LLCs go, individuals using their IRA to establish what they call a checkbook control entity, whereby the only shareholder is the IRA account. It's basically a one-member LLC uh, for the purposes of getting greater control over their funds. We've also seen a number of people invest in an LLC where there might be 10, 15, 50, 100 different members in the LLC, and their IRA is basically investing into a private hedge fund or private investment fund in that manner. Now, as far as the terminology when we talk about LLCs and LPs, it's important to understand um, some of the uh, parties and, and what's going on just to know when we, we get a little further into the examples of what we're talking about. Um, an IRA uh, within an LLC has to be a member. It cannot be a manager. Now, the member of an LLC is basically someone who has ownership of actual rights to profits and distributions, a party that has contributed cash or other assets into the LLC, and then the individuals who are responsible for running the LLC are the managers, people who actually sign the checks, make decisions, et cetera. And again, when we're talking about a self-directed IRA, your IRA can be, a man uh, can be a member in the LLC, but your IRA cannot be a manager. You'd have to have an actual person fulfilling that role. Similarly, with a partnership, generally speaking, there are limited partners and general partners. And a limited partner would be uh, an individual or an entity uh, that is simply a passive uh, party. They're just an investor, have no active role in the company. And generally speaking, an IRA in that situation is a, is a limited partner. Again, the general partner would be similar to the manager of an LLC, basically somebody who is in charge. So like the LLC, an IRA cannot be a general partner can only be a limited partner within that particular structure. Now the third type of uh, entity that we'll talk about and go through a couple of case studies on as well uh, is a trust. And this is kind of something we've seen in the last few years more and more people using to hold their IRA investments. Now a lot of people are familiar with trust in many different walks of life because they show up for a variety of different reasons uh, and people put them to use. Uh, with a number of different individuals as well. Now, people are, you know, trust can be an Ill, a living trust or a, a revocable trust, an irrevocable trust, a life insurance trust. A lot of these assets, a lot of these types of trusts 
have the same parties involved, but the underlying purpose is just quite different. If you're thinking about a revocable living trust, there's a situation where individuals uh, create those entities um, to pass along their belongings, to pass along their property when they die to their heirs. Uh, and in that situation, a parent might act as a grantor and transfer the assets uh, from their personal name into the name of the trust. The parents then name a trustee who will oversee and manage the assets held in the trust. And then ultimately, the beneficiary of that trust may be their children or grandchildren who ultimately will receive the assets. And in any type of trust, you generally have these three parties. The grantor putting the assets in, the trustee who is managing uh, the assets, and ultimately the beneficiary who is going to receive the assets when it comes out of the trust. Now, when you're talking about an IRA, the interesting thing is, is that since IRAs don't die, so in, going back to revocable living trust, you have parents maybe who are the grantors, when they pass away, that's when the trust provisions kick in and their children take over as beneficiaries. But within an IRA world, IRAs don't die, so an IRA is the grantor of the trust, and the IRA ultimately is the beneficiary, because the IRA must receive all of the profits, all of the assets, back out of the trust when the trust terminates. So we're, again, if you're looking to invest in an IRA, and invest your IRA into a trust, your IRA has to be the grantor and beneficiary, but you do need to have a third party acting as the trustee. The way the rules work with the IRA is not, in our estimation at least, it hasn't been decided by the IRS, permissible for you or your IRA to actually act as the trustee of that private trust. So you would need to get a third party. And that's something we'll contrast later on when we talk about the checkbook control LLC, where individuals do act as a manager to oversee their LLC assets. Now, generally speaking, the two types of trust that we see with an IRA are either a land trust, in which people use that type of entity to actually hold title to real estate, and we also see personal property trusts, where they might be holding title to various notes, mortgages, other unique assets. Now, with a land trust, at Advanta, we treat that basically as a real estate asset where we will receive the income to the IRA account, pay bills out of the account. Uh, it's just the titling is a little bit different. But for individuals who use personal property trusts, that's very similar to the checkbook LLC that we'll talk about a little bit later, where at, at Advanta, we send the cash into a trust bank account, and the trustee then receives income, pays bills in and out of that account, and the money does not come back to Advanta each time there are different transactions. And that will become a little bit more clear as we talk about checkbook control uh, a little bit later. But the personal property trust allows you to get somewhat checkbook control, although, again, you have to have a third party acting as your manager. Now, as far as the restrictions the IRS has when it comes to investing with your IRA, we'll take just a step back and then kind of fill, factor this into what we're talking about today. There are certain prohibited transactions and prohibited investments that individuals cannot make within an IRA account. Now, the only two investments that the IRS will not permit an individual to make within an IRA include life insurance and collectibles. You know, so if you go to the IRS publication, and look up what's allowed within an IRA or what's pro prohibited, they only list what's prohibited. The life insurance and collectibles are the only two investments that an IRA cannot make. Now, again, we talked about at the very beginning, it, um, the fact that you can hold real estate in your IRA doesn't mean that your custodian now will allow for it. So, again, each custodian could allow anything that they want to hold as long as it's not life insurance or collectibles because those, those are the two investments the IRS will not allow. The other restriction the IRS puts on investing in your IRA and making buying and selling assets or, or, or administering your account is there are certain disqualified persons who are prohibited from transacting with your account. And a disqualified person, if it is your IRA account, disqualified persons include yourself and your spouse, your parents and grandparents, your children and grandchildren, also any son-in-laws and daughter-in-laws, and also any business or entity that is owned or controlled by one of those parties. So a couple of quick examples, your IRA can't buy a piece of property that you already own, your, personally. 
your IRA, if it owns real estate, cannot lease it to one of these parties as well. Um, we talk about private placements. If your IRA wanted to buy stock um, in your own company, it's very likely prohibited as well. It's not something you'd be able to do. Um, again, these are just some examples, but there, when you're dealing with disqualified persons, a lot of times you have to step back and see exactly what that transaction would be. If you are, the IRA is transacting directly with one of these parties, or if any of these parties is getting a benefit from the transaction, the IRS could deem it to be prohibited. Now, individuals who are not disqualified include your brothers and sisters, your aunts, uncles, uh, nieces, nephews, your cousins, they're actually outside of your lineal tree. So it is permissible, at least under the, word, the rule of the law, that your IRA can transact with these particular individuals. They are not disqualified per se. Now, there's other facts and circumstances that could make them prohibited, but at least as far as the rule is written, they are not listed as a disqualified party. So again, the IRS regulations prohibit a transaction between a disqualified person and an IRA, again, that could be selling, exchanging, leasing assets between the IRA and the disqualified person, uh, lending money or extending credit. So if you were ever looking to get a loan, you cannot use your IRA as collateral. Or if your IRA is ever looking to get a loan to buy a piece of real estate, you cannot personally guarantee that loan. Again, that can make, that's why it makes it very difficult within the IRA world. Most of the purchases people make in real estate are for cash. It's not often that there is financing involved because of that particular rule that you cannot extend your credit for the benefit of your IRA. So again, when we talk about IRAs, it's important. There's no self-dealing, again, having a disqualified person on opposite sides of the deal, and there's no personal use. If you do use your IRA to buy a piece of property or to make an investment, you are not supposed to get any personal use out of that investment. Now, it is possible, and this is kind of a key distinction, it is possible to partner with somebody who is disqualified. And we're going to go through some case studies to illustrate that. This would be a situation where possibly, say, a husband and wife, both using their IRAs to buy the same piece of property from a third party. So in that circumstance, the IRAs aren't transacting necessarily with each other, but actually they're both buying an interest in property from some third party. And again, that's called a partnering arrangement, and we'll talk about that in a couple of case studies here in just a moment. So again, dealing with brothers and sisters and other family members are, is not prohibited per se, but we recommend if you're going to deal with those individuals that you deal with them on an arm's length, fair market value basis. Again, if the IRS were to determine that you were getting any type of benefit from the investment, it could be prohibited. So if I was lending money um, to my brother or my sister at less than kind of what fair market terms would be considered, then I'm probably getting some other type of ancillary benefit out of it uh, and then likelihood being considered a prohibited transaction. You also are prohibited from using a middleman between your IRA and a disqualified person. So if I own property personally, I cannot sell it to a third party and have that third party in turn sell it back to my IRA. The IRS considers that to be a step transaction. I've already mentioned you can't use your IRA own asset for your own current benefit. Uh, and also we, Say your IRA cannot provide sweat equity, or you cannot provide sweat equity, I should say, for your IRA-owned assets. So if you owned a piece of property, doing your own maintenance, repairing the walls, replacing the carpet, et cetera, would be prohibited under the rules. Now, you're prohibited from paying yourself, and you're prohibited from doing it free of charge. And people ask quite often, why am I, if I'm not going to get paid for it, what's the difference? Well, the IRS would consider your contribution of labor, basically you're, you're putting in your own man and your sweat and your work to enhance the value of your IRA. That's a contribution to your IRA, and contributions are only permitted to be made in cash. So that's kind of the reason for that rule. So we talk about private placement to kind of bring it back into the, what we were, the main part of the seminar today is things to avoid. So if you have used your IRA, to invest into a private placement. And we talk again, we're going to talk in a minute again about the checkbook control or maybe about just pooling your funds with other people in an LLC. That entity, that LLC or that trust that you create still is prohibited from investing in collectibles and life insurance. The entity that you've created is basically now an extension of your IRA and subject to these same rules. So you can't buy collectibles and life insurance. 
You still can't transact with disqualified persons. Uh, you still can't get a benefit from the assets. If you use an LLC along with your IRA to buy real estate, you still can't live in the property. And you also can't pay any compensation to a disqualified person. This is something that was addressed very specifically just about uh, almost two years ago now where the IRS challenged a taxpayer who had set up an entity uh, for his IRA to invest in and then ultimately was receiving money uh, as compensation from that investment. And that was uh, deemed by them to be strictly prohibited. It wasn't really a surprise to any of us in the industry. All right, we're going to jump into some case studies, hopefully flush out some more of this information. Again, if you have questions as we go, uh, please type them into the chat box on the screen. The first case study, I just want to illustrate if we have two individuals looking to buy real estate but not using an LLC or trust. How does that process work? Who is involved? What goes on? So we can contrast that when we talk about people using an LLC to accomplish uh, similar type investments. Now in this case study, you have both Paul and Linda, or husband and wife, looking to buy a piece of property. And you can look on the slide, you can see that they don't have enough, uh, neither one has enough within their own account to buy the asset and to get it fixed up to get ready to rent. So Paul and Linda decide they could use their IRAs together, again, as partners to buy this property from a third-party individual. And they figure they can start getting some net cash flow once the property gets purchased and gets fixed up. Now, again, not using an LLC or trust, this is how this transaction would work. Paul and Linda open up their accounts by filling out our paperwork to actually get an IRA account opened, getting it funded by transferring money from another custodian. Is, you're permitted to transfer money as often and whatever you'd like. If you have another IRA with another firm, you can move money back and forth between IRAs. As long as the money doesn't touch your hands, it's a non-taxable and non-reportable event. It can happen any, any number of times. So Paul and Linda have opened up their account, filled out the paperwork, got money transferred over, and then they found the investment property. And when they found the property they wanted to purchase, they put an offer in in the name of their IRA account. So the actual buyer on the real estate contract would be Advanta IRA for benefit of Paul's account and Advanta IRA for benefit of Linda's account, and it would list the percentage interest that each IRA is going to hold. In this case, it is 50-50, but the percentages need to be based on what uh, each party is contributing. So in this case, they're putting in a real estate contract in the name of the IRA. They're going to send that contract to us. We sign off on it, get it submitted. Then from that point, we take it to closing. We work with the title company. We work with the attorney to make sure that the wording on the contract ultimately is going to appear as well on the HUD statement, the deed, the title policy, uh, et cetera. Before we will sign any documents, we do, we do sign on behalf of the IRA for this investment. Before we sign, though, before we send any money, we will have Paul and Linda expressly approve of all the paperwork for us first. Once that's done, the purchase gets completed, and now their IRAs both own a 50% interest in the particular piece of real estate. And you can see again on this slide, this is the wording that would be used for their IRAs on the particular deed. Advance the IRA for benefit of Paul's account as to a 50% undivided interest, and then the same thing for Linda as well. And again, the percentage of each ownership has to be based on what comes out of um, each IRA account. So if Paul's IRA had put more in to the purchase price, he would then just have a larger percentage of ownership. Now, again, in this situation, Advanta is acting as the administrator for this piece of real estate and holding this property directly. So all expenses, the repairs, the maintenance, taxes, insurance, et cetera, must be paid directly from the IRAs and based on the percentage of ownership. So Paul and Linda, as they get bills related to this property, they will simply forward them to Advanta, we get a check cut usually within one or two business days at the most, and we get that bill paid out of their account. Likewise, once they get the property rented, their tenant would simply mail a check to our office to be deposited and split between Paul and Linda's account. So this is kind of how the transaction would work when they're not using an LLC or trust. And this is, uh, honestly, the majority of our clients, this is how the real estate is purchased. Simply in the name of the IRA and having us write the checks receive the income, and keep track of the records. And that's kind of a very important point we'll talk about again uh, in just a moment. We're going to contrast this now instead with people using an LLC to do the same type of an investment. In this case, we have Larry, Mary, and Gary who are all related. 
and therefore you know, be careful about the um, you have the issues with, with partnering as opposed to transacting. But they each have money in their Roth IRA accounts, and they want to invest their funds into real estate. But instead of having just three different parties listed on the proper on the on the deed, and ultimately sharing in the income and expenses with having the IRA or having us do it, they decide to be easier to consolidate their funds into an LLC, and basically have that LLC then buy the property and have the income and expenses go through that entity as opposed to coming back and forth out of the IRA each time. They will use an attorney that's uh, not required, but would suggest that you use an attorney or CPA to draft an operating agreement uh, listing each IRA as a one-third owner, because again, each IRA is putting in $50,000, so each will be one-third owner, and they elect La uh, Larry to act as a manager. So they, again, all open up their Roth accounts, filling out our paperwork to get the account opened, get funds transferred, and then telling us they want to fund the LLC from their Roth IRAs. So the members, you can go back to the slide several slides ago, the member, again, the owners in the LLC, whoever is entitled to ownership or equity within the LLC, that's the IRA account because the IRAs are putting the cash in. So the members would need to be listed as advanced IRA for benefit of the individual's name and their account number. Now, what's different about this, although Larry, Mary, and Gary are buying real estate, from Advanta's perspective, if they are forming an LLC to do so, the investment on our end is into the LLC. Now, with LLCs, the owners are generally reflected in the operating agreement. So an operating agreement would be, uh, can be anywhere between probably three and 30 pages long, depending on who's drafting it. But the operating agreement will state who the members are, who the manager is, how new members may or may not be admitted, et cetera, that operating agreement is the document that we will want to see. So with Paul and Linda, we wanted to see the deed and the HUD statement because they were buying real estate directly. But in this case, with these three individuals, they are buying into an LLC. We want to see the operating agreement. We don't necessarily care about seeing the HUD statement of the deed later on. So we look for the operating agreement and have it show the three IRAs and their percentage of ownership. Again, so the, the process involves, again, the three, Larry, Mary, and Gary, opening up their accounts, getting funds transferred from the other Roth IRA. They get an operating agreement drafted, and again, they can use, recommended to use an attorney, but it's not required. We just can't provide it for you. But they will send the operating agreement to us for review, basically showing their IRAs as the owners and as the members of that LLC. We will look over to make sure that it's, it's written correctly and it's documented, and also make sure that Larry, Mary, and Gary have each, again, initialed off that this operating agreement is acceptable to them. Once they've indicated that they have approved of it and we have their funds, we will sign the operating agreement, and we will then send the cash to the LLC. Now, Larry, as manager of the LLC, would be responsible for getting a bank account opened at whatever bank he wishes, but get a bank account open for that LLC have the funds go into that account, and then from there, Larry is able to buy the real estate in the name of the LLC. So instead of having Advanta IRA, FBO, et cetera, all on the deed, the deed and the HUD statement is simply going to be in the name of Real Estate Partners, LLC. And going forward, any income, the rents on that property, will come back into the LLC bank account. Any expenses, Larry will write a check from out of the LLC bank account. That's why they refer to this type of structure kind of as getting checkbook control with your IRA funds. Now, a lot of times checkbook control is for a single member entity. This one has happened to be a situation where there were three parties. So just remember, if you're doing a fractionally owned LLC, though, there's some other things you have to think about. In this case, you had three one-third owners in that LLC if they ever decided to put more money into that entity, so they either ran out of cash and needed more, more funds to pay bills, or they just wanted more cash to operate, the IRAs would have to put in the capital call since the IRAs are the one-third owners. If the IRA owners personally put in the cash, if Larry, Mary, and Gary simply wrote checks personally into the LLC, that would be a prohibited transaction. 
additionally, if instead of making capital calls, so they've, they've each put in 50 grand, they're looking to put in some more cash, they decide, hey, let's bring in a fourth party. Let's bring in another member, somebody else who's got 50 grand, that will give us our capital, and we can just add another member. We'll, we will all go from being one third owners to being one fourth owners within the LLC. Now that would be fine to do as long as the party that's coming in is not disqualified to any of the existing members. Now for instance, let's say Larry and Mary are married, Gary is their son, Gary's wife decides that she will bring her $50,000 into that LLC as the capital call. This could very well be and probably would be considered a prohibited transaction. Because by allowing Gary's wife to come into the LLC, the other three memberships all were diluted. They all went from being one-third owners to one-fourth owners. And they effectively transferred you know, 8% or so of their interest to Gary's wife. And again, the IRS would likely look at that as a prohibited transaction. So if you're going to be buying into a fractionally owned LLC, either make sure it's fully capitalized before you get in and make sure you have enough capital with which to work with, or you have some exit strategy. Either you have more IRA funds that you can contribute if need be, or you have the, maybe the ability to add another member, somebody who's not disqualified to that entity. Now, I did have a question uh, pop up. It said, if a person is employed at a private company and he has a 401k through that company, is still putting money into that 401k, can he roll that over to a self-directed IRA? And the answer is possibly. Um, if you are still employed with a company and your 401k is through that company, you will have to check with the administrator of that 401k to see if they will allow for two, either one of two things. Either they will allow you to do what's called an in-service rollover, whereby you continue with the 401k and you're allowed to take money out and just put it into an IRA, or sometimes these 401k plans have provisions that when you reach a certain age or some other type of event happens, you may be able to take that money and roll it over into an IRA. So unfortunately, I can't answer that question yes or no for you. You would have to contact the administrator of that plan and ask them would, you know, whether or not you would have the ability to, to roll this money uh, into an IRA. Once you no longer work there, you certainly would. And sometimes, again, if you were still employed there, there are some exceptions depending on your age, maybe how long you've been with the company, et cetera, to actually be able to access and move a portion of those funds. I do see someone with their hand raised. If you can um, invest in or write, type your question into the chat box, I'll make sure I get that um, addressed. Uh, another question popped up about investing in education savings plans and gold and silver. Um, again, I don't talk a whole lot about the education savings plans. It is certainly possible, though, if you have or establish a Coverdell IRA or a Coverdell ESA account, as they're referred to generally. Um, it allows you to put money in for um, a child, grandchild, et cetera, uh, where you can put money into those plans and the accounts will grow tax deferred uh, as you make investments. And then when the child pulls that money out of the individual, let's just say pulls the money out of that account for the um, you know, education expenses of that child, the money comes out tax free. Uh, and it is possible to use both education uh, savings funds to invest in physical gold and silver coins. I mean, there's collectible coins that are prohibited, which would include your kind of rare coins. But when we're talking about gold and silver bullion or gold and silver uh, American Eagle coins, that is permissible um, within an uh, education savings plan as well as an IRA. Uh, another question, and we'll get back to the presentation. Is I've invested in an LLC comprised of both self-directed funds and general investors. As a self-directed member, can I be the president of that LLC and assume daily management duties? That would be a great question to talk with an attorney about. My answer to that would probably depend somewhat on the, what the LLC's uh, primary activity is. If the LLC is basically an uh, investment entity where there have been pools of people putting money into that account to just make investments, um, and as long as you're not taking a management fee, you're not going to be paid for your role as president of the LLC, then it very well probably would be okay for you to do. Because we'll talk about checkbook control in just a minute, whereby it's an IRA 
um, investing in an LLC, and that IRA owner is indeed the manager. And even in our last case study, Larry was acting as manager or president of the LLC and doing that management duties. Now, the key thing, again, is you cannot be compensated if you're going to act in, act in that capacity. And if this is an actual business as opposed to an investment vehicle, if the LLC is making passive investments, not a problem. But if that LLC is a business and you're acting as president, um, that could be an issue because the IRS would probably impute that you are receiving some type of salary or compensation for those duties. Kind of hope I answered that question directly. If not, give me a call afterwards, and I'll be more than happy to go over that in a little bit more detail. All right, getting back to the presentation again, now checkbook control is usually found with a single member LLC where it's the IRA um, is the sole member of an LLC. The LLC has been managed by the IRA owner themselves, and that basically gives them that checkbook control authority. So in our last example, we had three individuals and three IRAs, but you could have just one IRA and one manager. So it could be just my IRA funds, I would like to have more control, I set up this type of entity in order to hold all of my investments through that LLC. It gives you a little bit more flexibility. It also comes with some risk that we'll talk about uh, in a little while. But we do, again, encourage you, if you're going to use this type of entity, I would encourage you to consult with an attorney prior to setting it up and operating uh, that type of structure. The, some custodians out there offer a one-stop shop where they will set up the IRA, they'll set up the LLC, uh, and they also charge several thousand dollars for that setup. Um, there's really no secret formula that they have uh, to make that type of uh, investment and, and structure. Um, if you're interested in using or reading the cases that support the checkbook control kind of strategy or, or, or use, uh, those are listed on this screen. The case of Swanson uh, back in 1996, it really paved the way for this industry. Uh, and then also the tax court memo regarding Ellis back at the end of 2013 where the IA tax court said that uh, being the manager of the LLC is not a problem, but in this particular case, Mr. Ellis, who was taking a salary from his IRA-owned LLC, that is what uh, was prohibited. Uh, we also certainly can give you names that if you're interested of attorneys or CPAs who are familiar with these types of entities, they can give you a little bit more guidance than we're permitted to do simply as your IRA administrator. and kind of They can help you set up the LLC and, again, probably pay far less using a local attorney than you would by using one of the custodians um, that's on the internet that charges you several thousand for the whole arrangement. All right, case study three, investing in a personal property trust. Now this is gonna look a little bit like, or a lot like I should say, a checkbook using a checkbook LLC, just with the notable difference, in this case, Teresa, who's looking at using some money to lend, is gonna utilize a trust rather than utilizing an LLC. Some individuals prefer using a trust because it's not as public. When you do file for an LLC, um, that's going to be listed in the state where it, you know, the LLC is established. They generally, the LLC uh, documents list who the manager is, et cetera. And with LLCs, you have to pay an annual fee to keep your LLC active. So for that reason, or for the opposite of those reasons, some people have chosen to use a personal property trust. Um, there's something that's not public record and doesn't have any type of annual filing fee. But Tony gets her brother, uh, I'm sorry, Teresa gets her brother Tony to act as a trustee for the trust. Now the different, big difference we have at Advantage when we talk about personal property trusts and the checkbook LLCs is that we will not permit an IRA owner to act as the trustee of their own trust. With the case of Swanson and the case of Ellis, we will permit an IRA owner to act as the manager of an LLC. But when you're using a trust, there's not the same case law that backs that up, so we insist that you have a third party to actually act in the role of trustee. In this case, Teresa uses Tony, her brother, to get Tony not disqualified uh, as being her, being her brother. Basically, Tony is going to do the same thing a manager of an LLC would be, and then as trustee, he will get a bank account and then sign checks, contracts, et cetera, and make investments on behalf of the trust itself. Teresa will simply just instruct him what assets to buy. Now, when writing a, when uh, actually question just came up really quick, could a spouse be the trustee? Um, no, I mean, a spouse is still a disqualified person. So when you're doing a private trust, we will not allow any disqualified person 
to act as the trustee. You have to have um, somebody who's not considered disqualified. Again, Teresa in this case uses Tony, her brother. Now, in drafting the trust agreement, now, we begin with the LLC, we wanted to see an operating agreement. If it's a private trust, we simply want to see a copy of the trust. And the beneficiary and grantor of the trust should be listed as advance IRA for benefit of Teresa's IRA account. Again, so again, her IRA is the grantor because it's going to contribute the $40,000 into the trust to be managed by Tony. And whenever this trust terminates and the assets leave the trust, they're going to go back to the IRA. So again, it's a little bit different than most trusts people are familiar with, but in this case, the IRA is both the grantor and beneficiary. Tony is then going to act as a trustee. Now, Teresa will forward our paperwork to us along with a copy of the trust that has been approved by her and signed by Tony. And ultimately, we will sign the trust on behalf of the IRA as the grantor, and we will send funds out of her account to whatever bank account Tony has established. Now, as trustee, he would need to get a bank account for that trust um, and get a separate tax ID number as well in order to even get that bank account. And again, he's then going to make the investments at her direction. And similarly to with the checkbook control, the income and expenses relating to the investments in the trust are going to go in and out of that trust bank account. So it is somewhat checkbook control in that you, Teresa does not have to come back to Advanta for every bill to be paid or to deposit all income. The slight difference being she would have to have a third party actually act in the place of trust as a trustee. Uh, next case study, investing in the late real estate with a land trust. Again, this is something we see done by individuals who are concerned about anonymity and not wanting their IRA account to actually be on the deed. That's usually their main concern when using a land trust. So if you're going back to the very first example with Paul and Linda, Linda the asset was titled as Advanta IRA for benefit of Paul Smith's IRA and his last name, and then, and then Linda Smith as well. So their name would be on public record because it is on the deed itself. Using a land trust, or some people at least feel using a land trust, helps avoid that issue. And we'll go through this case study here in just a moment. But with this type of an investment, we treat this as a real estate asset. So you can have a, your IRA invested through a land trust. You still need to have a third party acting as your trustee. But we will then administer the account as if it were real estate. So kind of as we did with Paul and Linda, we will receive rents and income to the account and pay any bills. It's just the documents are titled, uh, the property is titled in the name of the land trust. So in this case, we have Steve uh, has 100 grand, wants to buy real estate, gets his friend Tom to act as trustee of his land trust, and he's going to buy the property titled in the name of the land trust. And with the land trust, Generally, there's just a, there's a, a trustee and a beneficiary. The beneficiary would be Steve's IRA account. So this kind of roles in the transaction, kind of similar to uh, both the real estate and the LLC trust investment, in that, in fact, Steve's going to open up and fund his account in filling out our paperwork, transferring cash from his current SEP uh, over to the account with us. He finds a property, so he identifies a piece of real estate and writes a contract, but when he writes the contract, he's going to write the name of the land trust as the party, actually as the buyer's name on that particular contract. He will still, still submit the forms to us, and we will treat this as a real estate purchase. So we will want to see the land trust document that shows his IRA as the beneficiary of the land trust. We also will then want to see the HUD statement, the deed, any other closing documents, and have Steve approve all of these for us as well. So ultimately, we will sign the trust agreement on behalf of the IRA as the beneficiary, but then Steve's uh, friend Tom, as the trustee, Tom is going to then be signing all of the actual closing documents on behalf of the trust. But once Steve has approved all the paperwork, we ultimately will sign the, the document for the land trust and send the funds to the closing agent. So again, in a nutshell, again, the beneficiary and grantor is the IRA account. And the name on the deed would be Tom as trustee of the 123 Land Trust. Now, if, again, if Steve had not used a land trust, it would have been advanced IRA for benefit of Steve's account 
um, his name and an account number. Now, we do have the option, if you don't want to use a land trust but don't want your name on public record, we can simply title the property using your account number. So Steve, if, if the only thing he was concerned about was having his name on public record, could have simply elected to not use a land trust uh, and have the property titled as Advanta IRA, FBO, account number 1234. Other people, again, we're not, we don't give any legal advice. There's other people, re reasons people like to use land trust though. So if you choose to use it, the name on the deed would be Thomas Trustee of the 123 Land Trust. Again, if we are holding this as a real estate asset in our account, we will receive and deposit rents, and we will pay bills at Steve's direction. So he will, again, treating it just like a real estate asset, um, except for the fact that the titling on the deed is a little bit different. And if Steve wanted, it is permissible for him, for to have Tom get a bank account in the land trust name and hold this kind of again like a checkbook control LLC or trust and having Tom then with the access to re depositing rents and paying bills out of that account. But for the, I think almost all the land trusts we've seen has been a scenario where we still do all the administration for the asset in receiving rents and paying bills. Now the advantages to using these types of entities as we've kind of seen, um, one, there's some anonymity Again, the name on the deed is not the name of the IRA account. And I've said, Ori, we can uh, rectify that by just, if that's your only concern, keeping your name off and just using your account number. But for most individuals, it's having the control, uh, writing the checks as needed. Um, so if, in the case of the Larry, Mary, and Gary, if they're looking to buy real estate at an auction, uh, they have the LLC set up, they can write a check right then and there very quickly. Um, if you are paying your contractors and don't want to have to wait a day or so to get a check uh, issued from Advanta to them, um, it just gives you that greater degree of control. Again, I think within the industry, we're among the fastest in getting expenses paid within one or two business days at the most. Uh, if you have an asset with us and you're having us do the administration, but for some people, they just like that control factor and want that, want that checkbook control. For other clients, it allows them to hold a lot of different assets under one umbrella, so they can pay, they end up paying lower fees um, within their self-directed IRA. We consider a checkbook LLC or a personal property trust as simply one investment. So charge one flat $295 a year fee to hold that LLC, and then the client has their LLC go out and buy different properties, different notes, mortgages, et cetera, and only get charged the one fee from us, not get charged a fee for each different asset. So for people who are doing a lot of different deals, the LLC can save them time uh, and money, but they do need to be careful uh, with what they're doing because you could run afoul of the rules. Uh, being your own manager uh, is great for flexibility, but if you're not somebody who keeps good records, uh, these types of entities could be dangerous because you're responsible now for documenting all the money in, all the money out of the account. Also, it's easy to engage in something that's prohibited. If you have the checkbook and you look to make an investment and forget what the rules are, it's very easy to then make it. Now, if you were to do investments all going through Advanto, part of our job is to look as best as we can and make sure you're not doing something that's prohibited. Now, it's not foolproof because we don't always know who the other parties are involved, but if we see similar names on a document, we might ask what the relationships are. So if you're looking at lending money to your daughter from your IRA account and we see that the last names are the same, we will raise that red flag to you. Using an LLC, that transaction never goes through us because you're able to do that all on your own using your checkbook LLC. So it, they can be great uh, entities for flexibility, for people who really have a good understanding of the rules. For others, not having the oversight being easy to engage in a prohibited transaction. I think even the biggest thing is just not keeping good enough records. Uh, if you have your IRA assets all held and administered by us at Advanta, we can run a statement of your account that shows all of the income in, all of the expenses out of the account, and have all of the backup documentation along with that, the invoices, the rent checks, et cetera. If you're doing a checkbook control entity, you wanna make sure you keep those very similar records in case the IRS ever decides to audit. Now, if you, last slide here, and, and we'll, we'll wrap up the webinar today. How do you get the cash out? 
So you've put money into the LLC. You've had advantage to stroke a check or send a wire into the LLC or trust. Now you'd like to actually take some of that cash out uh, to use for personal reasons, go buy a boat, go buy a, a vacation, et cetera. This is how that process works. So you have cash sitting in your bank account with your LLC or trust. You'd have that money sent a check cut from the LLC or the trust back to the IRA as just income or dividends from that LLC or trust. We will take that check and then deposit it into the IRA as just you know, dividends or income from the entity. So now your IRA has some cash in it. You would then send us a distribution form for us to send the check back to you as the IRA owner as a proper distribution and issue the appropriate 1099. I've had people complain or ask, why do we have to do this middle step? Why can't I simply write a check from the LLC to myself or write a check from the trust to myself? And the reason is simply that we do the reporting, uh, the 1099s, uh, that keeps the IRS happy that we are reporting that the distributions are made. If you were to write the check from your LLC or trust personally, that 1099 never gets issued. And if it never gets reported, um, the IRS has a big problem with that and that you're not reporting uh, that taxable distribution. So this is the right way that it has to work, sending the money back to us and then having us turn around and send the check back to you as the IRA owner. It keeps everybody happy. It's worth the, definitely worth the few days that it takes to turn that around. I want to thank everybody for logging on today uh, to our webinar. We have always have more events on our website at advanceira.com. It could be uh, another webinar on a different topic. Uh, it could be a live seminar at one of our offices. And again, all of our education is always free. So whether you're participating in a webinar, whether you come to one of our live seminars, we provide lunch, it uh, will always be free. And as I mentioned, if you have any questions, anyone who's listening live, that didn't want to ask their question in front of everyone else or wanted to have a follow-up on something they did ask, please call or email me. Uh, if you're somebody who was listening to the recording, uh, please don't hesitate to give me a call or shoot me an email. Uh, we did have one other question came in. says, can I get a copy of the slides? Yes. Uh, everyone who participated uh, today or even signed up, even if they didn't participate in the live version, uh, we will be emailing a copy of the slides that we used uh, to everyone to have as a kind of as a resource for you. But again, please call me with any questions that you have. And again, I want to thank everybody for participating uh, in today's webinar. Thank you.